155 muckle chapter 10 part 10 um we are almost getting to the end here uh we've got um world systems theory here talking about periphery semi-periphery and core and mapping those onto primary secondary and tertiary labor sectors this is not to say that there are no stock brokers in uh togo and that there are no um uh, uh gold miners in uh, uh, the United States, it's just to say that it characterizes the whole economy of a country. Extraction, uh, you know, majority of people uh, in uh, Ethiopia are farmers, um, but uh, only like 4% of Americans are farmers, you see. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this is really boring and uh, I know that you have seen it before, so I'm just going to show it to you. Uh, basically, you've, you've, you've watched this before in movies. I know, I know that most of you have seen The Hunger Games. You've probably read The Hunger Games, or at least seen the movie. In 2012, according to The Hollywood Reporter, The Hunger Games became the most tweeted about movie on the planet. The basic dystopian premise is that the United States has devolved into Pan Am, a brutal empire of 12 subject districts ruled via an advanced technology from a capital in the Rockies. Each of the districts has an economic specialization, from coal mining to fishing to electronics manufacturer to making luxury goods. People and goods flow between the capital and each district, but people from each district are ignorant about those in other districts and rarely travel there. Because all goods flow to the capital, life there is lavishly rich and technologically advanced, but the 12 districts are in varying states of poverty. Because of this, long ago, the 12 districts rebelled against the capital district. After the rebellion was put down, for their punishment, the districts held an annual lottery to select two children from each district to compete in a fight to the death. The Hunger Games is a ritual celebration of the power of the capital and serves as a warning to the districts never to rebel again. In the build-up to the games, the selected children become instant celebrities. Twenty-three children die, but the single winner receives fame and fortune for life. During the game, hidden cameras follow the children's attempts to stay alive and kill the others, turning the whole event into a reality television show watched by everyone in all 12 districts. Citizens of the capital are far removed from the deprivation and open oppression of the 12 districts, and are generally preoccupied with extravagant fashion, parties, and mass entertainment like the Hunger Games. Most capital citizens are depicted as either oblivious of, or totally unconcerned with, the poverty and desperation that prevails elsewhere in Pan Am. What if the Hunger Games trilogy reflected the real world? What if Nigeria or Mozambique were District 11? Or what if Morocco or South Africa were District 2? Would that make Western Europe and Japan and the U.S. the capital? Actually, the world of the Hunger Games looks a lot like our world, as seen through the lens of world systems theory. World systems analysis, as developed by Emmanuel Wallerstein and others since the 1970s, views world history for the past 500 years as a complex system with political, economic, and social elements, including an international division of labor. According to Wallerstein, there are two basic kinds of world economies. The first is the traditional empire, a vast bureaucratic structure with a single political center and an axial division of labor, encompassing multiple cultures. But beginning in the 15th century, a new kind of system emerged, a large axial division of labor with multiple political centers and multiple cultures. This new world economy encompasses within its bounds empires, city-states, and emerging nation-states. It's a world economy, not because it encompasses the whole world, but because the economic system is larger than any political unit in the world. It's a world economy because the basic linkage between the parts of the system is economic. World systems analysis divides the world into three economic zones, the core, the periphery, and the semi-periphery. These divisions are rooted in the fact that there are basically three kinds of jobs, extraction, manufacturing, and service. The first, extraction, involves taking natural resources out of the ground. Agriculture, mining, forestry, fishing, and the like predominate in periphery countries like Vietnam and Bolivia. The second, manufacturing, 
involves transforming those raw materials into finished products. Countries in the semi-periphery, like Brazil and China, have large heavy industry sectors. The third, services, is the largest sector in all core countries. The label service industry conceals as much as it reveals. Stock analysts and fast food cashiers both provide a service. But the trend is toward more highly specialized labor. Office jobs, training and certification, soft skills. These job sectors are distributed unevenly around the world. There are many more stock analysts and bond traders in England than in the Congo, for example. The system was set up when Europe controlled 85% of the planet, and it demands greater global investment in the core than in other parts of the world. While infrastructures in the core, highways, airports, hospitals, universities, are built to meet the needs of the population, in the periphery, infrastructures are built to aid in the extraction of resources, which are then shipped to the countries of the semi-periphery and the core. Overall, the game is fixed to make the rich richer and the poor poorer. The system also creates dramatic class structures within the countries that take part in it. A small number of locals who collaborate with the institutions of the core usually become very wealthy, but very little of this wealth trickles down to the rest of the population. And this structure applies within some of the countries of the core as well. In the United States, for example, wealthier parts of the country have better infrastructures and more investment capital, while poorer parts, like the South and Appalachia, have infrastructures designed to support the extraction of resources. The in so we can, uh, <clears throat> we can pause here and we can talk about uh, uh, internal divisions between different parts of the United States. You can think about um, Ohio as sort of a um, semi-periphery and uh, Kentucky as more periphery uh, or West Virginia and New York as the core. Uh, and you can you can see it, uh, you know, look at the infrastructure, look at the um, the number of first class universities or hospitals in Ohio. How many first, uh, you know, first world class universities are there in Ohio? There's one. Or maybe two, if you count Case Western, it's it's a, you know, it's a it's a top uh, international internationally known university, and of course OSU. Um, Miami University is a nationally ranked university, so is UC. Um, but but they're not they're not in the same league. Uh, and then how many of those are in Kentucky or West Virginia? How many do they have? None. And look at hospitals. You know, we've got uh, Cincinnati Children's is nationally ranked. Uh, we've got the Cleveland Clinic is nationally ranked. How many do they have in Kentucky? How many do, how many world class uh, you know cancer centers do they have in West Virginia? They just don't have them. Um, how many do they have in New York? How many world class universities do they have in New York? <laughs> A dozen. <laughs> how many world class hospitals? You know, uh, and and so you can see that that uh, um, it's very very similar stuff going on in the United States. Uh, as there uh, uh, as there are from you know from from the United in the United States uh, between the United States and Africa, um, uh, there, there's similar uh, similar leaps going on, similar internal colonization going on. Let's continue our video. The justice of this system becomes naturalized, especially for those living in the core. So it's often difficult for them to recognize their own place in the system. Seen this way, the world of the Hunger Games is close to our own world. The core capital district rules the 12 districts through information, finance, and military force. The semi-peripheral districts, 1 through 8, produce luxury items, weapons, electronics, electricity, transportation, and textiles. Finally, in the periphery, districts 9 and 10 produce grain and livestock. District 11, the agricultural south, is poor and black. And in poor and white Appalachian District 12, where Katniss comes from, farthest from the capital, Avoiding starvation is the primary goal of the population. In fact, the 12 districts nearly perfectly map onto the three categories of core, semi-periphery, and periphery. The elites of the capital enjoy high standards of living, wear gaudy clothes, practice high-tech body modification, and engage in extravagant consumer habits. With very few exceptions, they are portrayed as self-absorbed to oblivion, throwing away luxury food and playing pointless games despite the malnutrition, violence, and desperation that prevail in the poorest of the 12 districts. The elites ignore the tremendous resentment building up in those districts in response to visions of capital luxury beamed in daily via television. The system's unjust cruelties have been naturalized, especially but not exclusively for those living in the core, and so it can sometimes be difficult to look through the eyes of someone on the other side.
The heroine of the Hunger Games, Katniss Everdeen, is not from the core, but from the periphery. She is a victim of the capital, raised in a small coal mining town, her father dead in a mining accident, her mother recovering from emotional collapse. Katniss keeps her mom and her little sister alive through her prowess at poaching game from the surrounding hills. When her sister is chosen for the games, Katniss volunteers to replace her, resolving to give her life for her sister. Instead, once she gets on TV, Katniss woos the elites of the capital. They love her, but she does not love them back. She becomes first a figurehead for revolution, and eventually a genuine, violent insurgent, seeking to overthrow the core and rupture the system to create something new in its place. Readers and viewers love Katniss Everdeen. They love reading about her and watching her in movies. We identify with her struggle against the capital. But if Katniss Everdeen lived in our world, had been born in our global periphery, how would she feel about us? And how much would we identify with her, and with her struggle, if we saw her, not in a movie, but on the TV news? Okay, so you can see there um, <clears throat> a little bit of insight maybe into your own position uh, with regard to the rest of the world. Uh, clearly, um, the U.S. Uh, uh, media machine pumps out movies and television shows for the rest of the world, and the rest of the world gets them before we do, of course, because uh, so many of the times they are intercepted um, while being printed. You know, the DVDs get intercepted and, and sold, uh, and you can buy them on the street. Usually you buy uh, uh, first release movies uh, on the street two weeks before they hit theaters in the U.S. Uh, at least I could in Morocco. Um, uh, you can get uh, usually you can get most of the uh, entire seasons of American TV shows in Cuba, for example, on a on a little uh, thumb drive, uh, you know, before they're released in the U.S. So um, it's it, it's clear that we are pumping our media um, about our expensive consumer habits, about our um, you know hundreds of dollars spent on tattoos or on pet surgeries uh, to the rest of the world, and they know this. They know exactly uh, how much we spend. Uh, on our expensive consumer habits and how little we know about their um, suffering and poverty. Again, uh, like I say, um, um, the they do not hate us, but if they did hate us, they would hate us because we don't know why they should hate us. <laughs>